How come you started philosophizing with children? In 1979, I finished my degree, and I thought, I don't want to be this when I grow up. I just don't want to be an academic philosopher. I wasn't cut out for it. There's got to be more to philosophy than this. In 1984, I had the very good fortune of learning about Matthew Lippmann and his work with Philosophy for Children. I went off to Montclair and spent three weeks there experiencing the joy of being together with people and actually doing philosophy. And in the last week, the last week, they brought in some kids, the real test. And man, what I saw coming from those kids was like, this is it, folks. This is it. I want to do this for the rest of my life. For me, it was as close as I've ever come to an epiphany, philosophy in a joyful, fun way. I came back to Hawaii with that in my suitcase, and pretty soon I was up to my knees and my elbows in kindergarten through sixth graders. I was hooked. The rest is history. Got it? So, is there a guy that has inspired you? Well, for sure. In the beginning, it was Matt Lippmann truly inspired and inspiring as a man in the work that he's done. Since I've been at work in Hawaii, it's become the teachers and their students with whom I've worked who continue to inspire me in all that I do. Let them start to teach you and you're off. Finally, I must say, it's the colleagues that I've met over the years around the world who are engaged in this magnificent experiment of changing education. If you had to explain your approach on the basis of three sentences, what would they sound like? The first, don't be in a rush to get somewhere. We live in a world that's gone crazy in its rush to get somewhere. With less and less time for real contact with each other and for opportunities for deep thinking. Make P4C time an oasis where we're not in a rush. This is a time for creating a space for deep thinking. Got it? Second, create an intellectually safe community. If P4C time is really going to be an oasis, it has to be an intellectually safe place where people feel the freedom to express their thoughts. Third is inquire. Inquire together where no one knows where it's going. No one knows in advance what the answer is or will be. And whatever the topic that topic arises from the deep interests of that community. How do you put your approach into practice? Well, first I would say I live it. P4C has become so much a part of who I am and what I do that I would say, yeah, I live P4C. And the second thing is I and we put a lot of emphasis on building community. If anything, I think it's under-emphasized in the community of inquiry. Lots on inquiry, but not much on community. So in our approach, it's building that community. It's making a community ball. Toss me a community ball. Yeah, we make one of these. In all our P4C Hawaii communities, we make one of these. The kids make it together. And they learn that, whoa, this is something different. And the third thing that we do is to provide long-term support for whoever joins the P4C team. We have teachers that have been with us for 20, 25 years and beyond. So I live it, help create communities that do it, once in, always in. Please define the most important characteristic, skill, 
and attitude out of a pedagogue supposed to philosophize with children. Four on my list. Compassion? Right, right, compassion. Yeah? That's right, compassion. Curiosity. 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 Playfulness. Right? I tried. Playfulness. See? Told you. And humility. That's it. What role does the pedagogue's knowledge of the history of ideas play for the philosophical conversation? This one's really tricky. I like to distinguish between what I call Big P philosophy, which is the academic philosophical practice of philosophy, and Little P philosophy. For Big P practice, a knowledge of the history of ideas is essential. But I think that the center of gravity shouldn't be or needn't be, and especially if we're going to be working with children, can't be on that history of ideas. Little p philosophy starts with and is grounded in what do we think? What do I think? What do you think? And taking whatever that is that we're thinking at that beginning to a deeper level, to scratch beneath the surface, and to use tools that I think are philosophers' tools, the Good Thinker's Toolkit tools. Well, why do you think that? What do you mean by that? What are we assuming? Can you give me an example? Is that true what you've just said? Could Santa die? How come the fairy didn't come and pick up my tooth? Will space go on forever? All of those ideas that come from us, start with those, stay with those, scratch beneath the surface of those things, and then if and when it becomes relevant to reach out beyond the circle of our community to that history of ideas, go for it. Go for it. Become aware that that resource, those resources are out there, but keep it grounded. Keep the center of gravity in that community with what we think and what Lippmann so wonderfully called and aptly called the self-corrective inquiry. We can correct the ideas that we have in the beginning. That's part of scratching deeper. But in little p philosophy, the center of gravity is in that community. Could you tell us about one particularly beautiful experience whilst philosophizing with children? Wow, well there's a tough one, because the longer you do P for C, the list really grows and grows and grows. This one particular beautiful experience happened shortly after my grandson's fifth birthday. We were very close to Christmas. He was set to go to bed, and he said to me, Grandpa, could Santa die? knowing that a question like that is not to be answered in a short way or a quick way. Indeed, it's a succulent invitation to an inquiry. And the next morning at Waikiki School, I thought, I've got to ask the kids. I've got to ask the kids, what would you say to my grandson? So starting with first grade, I asked the kids, could Santa die? The first young fellow to speak said, well, yes, Santa could die, but you know, Santa and Mrs. Claus have kids. And, he added, it's so cold at the North Pole that Mrs. Claus' body knows how cold it is, so her babies are born with white hair. The second child to speak said, well, I agree that I think Santa could die, but, you know, Santa's not that person that we see at the mall ringing the bell. Santa really is a spirit. Santa is the spirit of Christmas and of kindness. And if kindness could go out of the world, or would go out of the world, 
indeed, Santa could die. And finally, one child said, well, you know, I think maybe Santa's our mom and dad. And of the many things that were so beautiful about that experience was the thoughtfulness with which each of these young children listened to each of these possibilities, not trying to argue, not trying to convince one another, but just a kind of unstated, shared appreci appreciation of the possibilities that are out there. Now that was a beautiful experience. Please complete the following sentences. Children are... A reminder. A reminder of what we once were and an inspiration of what we still can be. To philosophize means to me... Being together with people, reflecting on things that we care deeply about, and leaving with a deeper understanding of each other and of those things. To philosophize with children means to me. It means being open to listening to and learning from the amazing and wonderful insights and comments that come from these students, whatever their age. My vision is that all... My vision is that all children everywhere in the world will have the opportunity of having p for c a part of their lives from the very beginning all the way through to the end. Is there anything you would like to tell our trainers? Yes. I would encourage trainers to be patient, to be patient with yourself and with those with whom you're working. Don't feel the pressure to be an expert. The people that you're working with, help them to feel that you really need them as much as they are going to feel that they need you. They bring a lot of expertise as teachers to their craft. And so you very much appreciate that expertise that they have. And you're going to be learning from them about how can we together share what we're learning together with our students. We're all a vital part of what's going to happen. And happening or not is going to be depending on all of us realizing that. It requires trust, a willingness to risk and be vulnerable. There are deep changes that can and probably will take place within you and your students as you go along. The rewards are as great as the challenges. Don't forget that, but be patient. Thank you. That's all, folks. Bye, Got it?